My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a Hollywood film and television editor, a documentary director, father of two, an American ninja warrior in training, and the creator of Optimize Yourself. For over 10 years now, I have obsessively searched for every possible way to optimize my own creative and athletic performance, and now I'm here to shorten your learning curve. Whether you're a creative professional who edits, writes, or directs, you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're a weekend warrior, I strongly believe that you can be successful without sacrificing your health or your sanity in the process. You ready? Let's design the optimized version of you. Hello, and welcome to the Optimize Yourself podcast. If you're a brand new optimizer, I welcome you and I sincerely hope that you enjoy today's conversation. If you are inspired to take action after listening today, why not tell a friend about this show and help spread the love? And if you're a longtime listener and optimizer OG, welcome back. Whether you're brand new or you're a seasoned vet, if you have just 10 seconds today, it would mean the world to me if you clicked the subscribe button in your podcast app of choice because the more people that subscribe, the more that iTunes and the other platforms can recognize this show, and thus the more people that you and I can inspire to step outside their comfort zones to reach their greatest potential. So many people working in post-production around the world are obsessed with making the transition from being an assistant to being an editor. But does the journey end once you're sitting in the editor's chair or has the journey just begun? Editor and director Susan Vale, who has worked on shows such as Space Force, Grey's Anatomy, This Is Us, and frankly, too many to count, has been helping to answer these questions as a mentor to many in scripted entertainment in Hollywood. And she's become so passionate about the subject of helping assistants make the transition and then, of course, stick the landing, that she even recently led an Editor's Guild panel that was titled Bumped Up, the Leadership Workshop for New Editors. So what are the most important questions that assistants who have recently been promoted into the editor's chair don't know to ask? What surprises might come their way that they aren't prepared for? What politics should they be aware of? What soft skills are necessary to build relationships and then get invited back to other jobs in the future? And conversely, if you haven't made the transition yet, but you are oh so close, Well, then what differentiates you from other people that are vying for the same position, especially if they're more experienced? What can you do to stand out? We're going to talk about all of that and more. Now, as one side note before we jump in, this interview was conducted shortly before the pandemic struck, sometime in early March. So as you're listening, I do want you to keep that in mind and provide some context as we discuss some of her upcoming panels that unfortunately have been canceled, as well as any of the general networking strategies that might involve things that we can't do amidst a global pandemic. If you are inspired by today's conversation and you are ready to up your networking game, specifically your outreach emails, then I invite you to download a free copy of my insider's guide to writing great outreach emails. In this guide, I will break down the process of writing outreach emails so you understand exactly what will get you a response. I'm going to teach you why cold outreach is the most important soft skill you must develop if you want to advance your career, especially during global pandemics. I will show you the five most common mistakes that people make when writing their outreach messages. And then I break down step by step how to write an amazing outreach message that will get a response so you can seek advice, connect with a potential mentor, and build the right relationships so when the job market does open again, you are at the top of people's lists. To download this brand new guide for free, visit optimizeyourself.me slash email guide, and that's all one word. All right, without further ado, my conversation with editor and mentor Susan Vale. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspirational interview, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. This episode is made possible for you by, you guessed it, ErgoDriven, the creators of the Topo Mat, my number one recommended product if you are interested in moving more and not having sore feet at your height adjustable or standing workstation. Almost every new person that I meet in this industry starts our conversation with, hey, I got a Topo Mat because of you. It changed my life. Thank you. If you are not standing on one today, I cannot recommend it enough. It's super comfortable. It's an awesome conversation starter. And by the way, it's also scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your workday. 
To learn more and get your Topo mat, visit optimizeyourself.me slash Topo. That's T-O-P-O. I'm here today with Susan Bale, who's a member of the American Cinema Editors. She is a television editor that works in both comedy and drama. She's working on the upcoming show Space Force, which is for Netflix. She's worked on This Is Us, Lodge 49. She spent eons and eons working on Grey's Anatomy, all of which I'm sure we're going to talk about today. But actually, the whole reason that we're doing this show, to be perfectly honest, my ulterior motive is I want to hear all about this double McGum <laughs> So, Susan, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to speak with you. So seriously, when you when you put this in your bio, I'm like, ooh, this is an interesting little tidbit. So let's just start there. Let's break it up a little bit. Tell me about being a twin and ending up in a gum commercial. And everybody that's like less than 30 years old is like, what is he talking about? I know, I know. It's funny because um, my husband was like, I don't think that's a very interesting point of your bio. And I said, believe me, it is. <laughs> because it is something that... I think those of us of a certain generation do do like to hear about. Yeah, I, I was born and raised in LA and I have an identical twin sister. And when we were born, um, my parents had no idea they were having twins. It was a complete total shock on the day we were born. They were like, you got two coming out. And I think they were a little unprepared, both you know financially and whatever. And, and so they saw an ad in the newspaper for you know twins desired for... TV and motion picture roles, like especially infant twins because of child labor laws. And so when we were about six weeks old, we started doing some film film and TV work. It was sporadic over the years. And occasionally it would just wind up being like one TV movie, one feature film every, you know, it's like every year there seemed to be just maybe one project that would go through and like a commercial here and there. But the, the biggest and best known one we did was an, a double mink gun commercial. I think we were like nine or 10 years old. So I don't want to say what year that was, but it was in the early-ish to mid eighties. And it was not the one that everyone thought we were in because there was one with these two girls riding bicycles around. And even my grandparents thought that was us. We wish that was us because it was on 24 seven. Ours was a carnival themed commercial where we were making faces in a fun house mirror. And I have a whole philosophy about how people treat twins kind of as freaks that you can talk to. <laughs> and so I was like, and maybe it was all formed by getting to be part of the uh, carnival <laughs> themed <laughs> double income commercial. But still, it was, it was a special thing that we got to do. And um, my sister was in like a Kool-Aid commercial. And uh, a lot of times what would wind up happening was one of us would get cast and the other one would be the backup, you know, for the, for child labor laws. But Double Mint was one of the few commercials that really put both twins front and center. So it was kind of rare and fun for us both to be in something at the same time. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a really cool, uh, cool <laughs> to start and also a good segue because you want to, you want to talk about uh, freaks that you're, you want to talk to. <laughs> Let's talk about editing, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> Right? I know we're hobbits in dark rooms that nobody, you know, knows our, what our work is, but, um, but you know, we do. So. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, well, when you look at it from the perspective of the directors and the producers, we're kind of the freaks that you really, really want to talk to, right? Yes. Yes. We know all the secrets. Exactly. We know where <laughs> all the bodies are buried. <laughs> Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so the, the reason that I have you on the show today, kind of the, what precipitated uh, you coming on here, there are actually uh, several things, but the, the main reason is this uh, panel that you started doing for the Editors Guild uh, began last November, and you're going to be doing another one at the end of March. And it's all about making this transition from the assistant chair to the editor's chair. And this is something that I have spent probably the last two or three years working with people either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, coaching and mentoring them through the process of what it takes from a networking perspective, what it takes from a craft perspective. But there's a whole other part of the conversation that I've helped some people through which is actually understanding how to navigate the, the changing of the roles on a more political level as well. So there, there's a whole lot of different machinations to this, and I want to get into all of it. But really, I think the best place to start is just understanding a little bit more about your background, because I'm sure that your background heavily influences, <laughs> inspired why you decided to create this panel. And I know that this is something that's important to you. So let's just start a little bit more. Uh, let's just start with understanding your origin story, so to speak. So how, like, how did you come into oh, this? Yes. How do you climb the ranks? Let's just get to know a little bit more about your yeah. history. Yeah. And let me say first though, Zach, thank you for the mentorship that you've been doing and 
that process that you're really looking at and trying to help people with and understand better. I just, it's so important and it's, it's information a lot of people don't have. And so I actually would like to take this moment to ask if you would someday be a guest on our panel, the leadership oh workshop panel, Anytime. because it sounds I, like you'd be an incredible part of it. I'm so, a panel <laughs> whore. Are you kidding? Absolutely. We, just we show really me, want, tell me when to show up. Yes. We really want to do it, you know, multiple times a year, you know, probably like three or so times a year. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to call you for one of the next ones then. Uh, Absolutely. Be, I'm there. Be on the aware. Okay. Thank you. That'd be great. Uh, my origin story. That's fine. I like that. Uh, I guess, you know, we touched on it a little bit. I, I had this experience of, of um, working as a, a child actress. It's not something I really enjoyed. My sister was much more, um, I think, extroverted in that way and a performer. But I remember being fascinated by being um, on studio lots and wondering what that thing was that the grips would come up and wave in front of my face. And I'd always ask and they'd say, it's measuring light. And I was like, for a child to hear that, I, I thought, how in the world can you measure light? What is that? And so those tools and the behind the scenes nature of filmmaking was just something that interested me early on. It wasn't until I went to college that I, um, well, and let me take, let me go back one step. Um, my senior year of high school, I got to um, edit a documentary um, and I watched a friend edit a music video at our, at our school in like an art, in our AP art class. And it was the first time I ever saw deck to deck editing with VHS and SVHS tapes. And so I tried my hand at it and made a little documentary about learning to rock climb. And, uh, and it was uh, just a great experience. I mean, so that was my first time really editing. And I, was, I just kind of thought that was neat. Um, I also think around that time, I'd started noticing that when I would watch movies, I had this like um, invisible instinct that would click in my head. And I felt like I could feel where scenes had been lifted or I don't know. I started to like, it's something that I think I still use as an editor today. And we all do. It's like where you can, where you feel like that tug when you're watching a movie of like something happened there. And I think I know that they moved that scene. And I I remember recognizing that I had that that instinct going when when I was in the movie theater. So you learned how to read the matrix (laughs) very early. I just realized I had a sensitivity to it and I, I found that interesting. I don't think I, I really knew much what editing was, but, um, but it was, something was tugging at me. And um, I went to college and I took my first film history class and just my brain exploded. And it was so funny to be coming from LA and having never thought I would work in film to suddenly be studying foreign film and the history of film and film theory and the, the, you know, the female gaze and the hero's journey and all that narrative. And just to be so, it was the first time I've ever been so excited about something, writing papers. And I wrote a paper on Chinatown and on Truffaut films and feminist films. And it was just a film in Louise. Oh my God, The Color Purple, all these movies. I just loved, loved doing it. And for a little while, I thought I might go into, you know, film, teaching film, PhDs and critical studies and stuff. But I was lucky enough to live in Los Angeles and I would come back to LA and my parents were very supportive of me just looking for internships in the industry. And I think I interned for a producer and just read scripts and books and they were terrible, just terrible. But, you know, it was a great way to see that spectrum of of all the the stuff that's out there. And while I was in this internship that I did, was like, is this what it is to work in the film industry? I, I saw in the trades that the I think I, I can't remember which I have to figure out which guild it was or whether it was just the, you know, um, you know, status or whatever the academy. They offered a, a, a seminar in editing and it was just going to be a, a weekly evening seminar for over six weeks with like a famous feature editor showing clips and talking about editing. And I thought that sounds kind of interesting. I think I was 19 years old when I signed up for it. I think I was the youngest person there. It was filled with mostly professionals who would drink coffee and smoke cigarettes at the break. And I didn't do either of those things. <laughs> so I, I felt incredibly shy and awkward, but I was so fascinated by what I was learning and seeing, um, I think, oh God, Dee Dee Allen spoke, uh, Sheldon, Sheldon, um, Sheldon Kahn. Kahn. Sheldon Kahn. Thank you. I was about to say Michael Kahn. No, it's Sheldon Kahn. Um, a, a number of a great editors spoke. I still have the little folder, you know, that I kept because I was like, I think I'm seeing legends in front of me <laughs> and uh, I'm just seeing what they were talking about. Um, I can't remember which editor it was. I believe it was a female editor. I don't think it was Dee Dee Allen, but maybe it was because whoever it was, was brought in to kind of polish La Bamba. And she showed the opening sequence of La Bamba as it had been scripted. And then she showed her cut and it was completely, 
completely mind blowing to me, you know, how she pivoted the film entirely and switched the focus of the story and the, and, and put us right more in the beginning of the story with his death. The original introduction started with the brother riding his motorcycle around talking about drugs in LA. It was so like, not the story <laughs> of Richie Valens. And, um, and she just was able to show how she made this mark on this movie that so many of us had seen. So that lit the flame in me of like, I think editing is amazing. So eventually I came back after college and went to film school at USC, knowing I wanted to explore all aspects of filmmaking, but really knowing editing was my first love. So while I focused on both writing and directing and editing, um, editing became what I jumped right into uh, as soon as I, I left USC. And I assistant edited in some documentaries. I had partly got involved in the documentary track at USC because I'd been told by mentored by some professors that if I really wanted to be a great editor, starting in documentary was a terrific place because you really learn how to be a storyteller and find the through line to the story really quickly. And so um, my documentary professors were amazing and helped me get work right away on on some really great documentaries. And I'm just going to give you a little advanced preview that one of those documentaries directly led to me working on Space Force today. So that was a job I had 20 years ago paid off (laughs) in 2020. It's kind of amazing. Yes, um, that's a good thing for anybody listening to to keep an eye out for. That's like, oh God, all the stuff I'm doing is not paying off. Been reaching out to people. It's taken me a month or two months. Sometimes it takes decades for this stuff to pay off. Yeah, and the the shortcut to that, I mean, just to to synopsize that story was that I was the assistant editor to a a wonderful woman named Claire Scanlon and we were doing an A&E documentary on circuses. And, um, and we worked on one or two other projects together and loved working together, but then we kind of fell out of touch. And then I found out she was, uh, working on the office. Like, so she'd moved from documentaries and reality to the office. And we, we got back in touch because we had a mutual friend at the office, Sarah Levy, who was their amazing camera operator. And it was just so great. And then around that time, we both were starting to direct a little bit. And so it was just really great to meet another woman editor who was also looking at directing on the show they'd been on for a while. Since then, Claire has taken off as a director, but it was around that time I also was leaving Grey's Anatomy and really wanted to work in comedy. And so she's, again, just continued to mentor me and help connect me to people to help me get find jobs on on half-hour comedies. And she's the one who recommended me for Space Force. And so there you go. The job I had in 2000, 2001 (laughs) got me this job that I'm completing right now in 2020, which is pretty amazing. So yeah, so that was my, to back up, was working in documentaries, but found that I really wanted to get back into scripted. So I worked on one documentary that was just very, very depressing and sad. And it was about uh, child abuse. And it was it was really intense. And I was kind of like, I just want to know that these are actors and that this isn't really happening to them. And that that compelled me to go back to the editor's guild and call them up and say, how do I, how do I, how do I get, I'd done one scripted, you know, Showtime movie. And I was like, how do I get back on, <laughs> onto that track? And they said, put your name on the available list. I said, okay. So, I, and I was able, at that time, you were able to kind of see the available list and see other people that were on it. And I remember seeing people who had credits on shows that I watched and I loved. And I thought, how in the world <laughs> will anyone hire me based on some documentaries that haven't even aired yet? And one, you know, cable movie with Olivia Newton-John in it <laughs> that I worked on. So I decided, it was a really pivotal moment for me because I decided that I was a, I had a lot more to offer than my resume and the, the the words on the page of that resume. And I knew that I, you know, I have a positive personality. I'm bright and educated. And I, whenever I'd been on a project, I'd always found that directors and producers really enjoy talking with me and that I, I always had something to contribute. So even though I didn't have credit, the strong credits yet, I was like, I know I have something to contribute. And that's just my perspective, my background, my personality. So let me put that into my resume somehow because the credits aren't enough. And so when I put that up on the available list, you know, there's a special skills section where I think you're supposed to write Pro Tools and Avid Media Composer and Adobe, blah, 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 blah. And instead I wrote Girl Wonder, able to solve problems in a single bound, blah, 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 you know, stuff like that. Just something that was creative that injected a little of my personality into, into that. And it was all true because coming from documentary you had to be your own tech support. So I actually <laughs> wasn't, was, was, was savvier than I realized, you know, I'd never had tech support on any show. I had to, I had to like build the avids myself, practically myself. And so it was a really, it was, it was truthful, but it was also my personality too. 
that statement that I put on that special skills list is what got uh, me the phone call from the editor, Victor Dubois, who I wound up assisting for two or three years. And he really kind of jump-started my career for me, which was amazing. And eventually we did the Grey's Anatomy pilot together. And it was on that that he, he really just started to like create the opportunity for me and, and got them to give me an episode um, at the start of the second season. And then that's, that's where it all began. I was going to say, and look how that worked out for you. <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm still extremely grateful. And, and all um, because you decided that you wanted to stand out and be honest, authentic, and unique in your Union resume. I love it. Thank you. I, I, so to this day, that's one of my pieces of, of advice that I always give, which is like, please, in some way, inject some tiny bit of yourself and your personality into your resume. And some people say, that's unprofessional. And I'm like, I, d- I don't think so because it's our industry. What we do as editors is very personal. You, we spend a lot of time in close quarters with with the writers and directors and producers we work with. And I think they'd want to know that you, you know, you have some interesting facets about you that, you know, make you a fun and interesting person to be around and to collaborate with. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, it's so easy to fall prey to so much of the advice that's online when it comes to resumes or cover letters or applying for jobs. But all that advice is meant for people that are applying for the assistant regional vice president manager of Google or Microsoft or whatever. And this is a very, very personal industry. We're we're in a service-based industry. And come on, professional? We all go to work in our pajamas and t-shirts and blue jeans. Like, we're not professional. If we wanted to be professional, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. So yes, inject your personality. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Zach, when I, I remember hearing when that you, when, that you were on Cobra Kai and I was like, that could not be a more perfect job. That is like uh, the, the enthusiasm and the personal experience you have in training probably brought so much to that collaboration on a show that's about martial arts and, you know, striving and, and, and competing. And it's, it's just a, that that's I was so happy when I heard you were doing that. So, oh, well, thank you. And, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah I mean, it yeah. was it, it was a really really good fit for me. Um, and, that, and I have a whole podcast about how I pursued it, so I'm not going to go down that road. I, I know I, I want to listen to that one. I saw you interviewed the showrunners, and I was like, oh, I bet that's going to be great. And I I look forward I look forward to listening to that. One. Really, it all just comes down to I uh, I'd never heard of the show, and then all of a sudden uh, somebody had passed it along to me, and I saw the trailer on YouTube, and then I. Um, like everybody else, been binge watched the entire first season. <laughs> yeah. And I said, there is no show on TV. I don't care what it pays. There's no show on TV that's a better fit for me. Like I am made for this show. And I made it my life's mission to convince the showrunners and creators that it was made for me, <laughs> um, which is what the whole podcast is about. But yeah, like it's it's such a good right. fit. Yeah. Um, and and I, how lucky the th- for them that you pursued that and you know were able to to bring your skills to their production, you know, like very, they are, they are very fortunate as well. And I appreciate you saying that. It's very nice. <laughs> sure. But it just, it goes to show that, uh, like what, something that I've talked about for years has been this idea of so many creative professionals that are dealing with constant burnout and depression and all of these factors, like all the lifestyle factors and the stress and everything else about this industry. But what I've really come to find after boiling it all down is that it really just comes from a disconnect between what you're passionate about and what you're doing all day long with your life. And if you're not really creatively engaged or fulfilled by the work that you're doing, you're just setting yourself up for failure and all these lifestyle issues and eventual burnout and depression and all of these things. We, we won't go down that rabbit hole too much. But I do think that that helps somewhat dovetail into the, the topic at hand today which is this idea of really starting to, to switch positions between assistant editor and editor, because there's a lot more wrapped up into it rather than just, well, I have to learn new skills on Avid or this, that, or the other thing. There's so many other factors that go into it. So I guess the, the place that I want to start, which may feel like a you know off the beaten trail question, mm-hmm. but you had mentioned to me that it wasn't just a matter of you wanted to put a panel together to help share some of the ideas about making this transition. This is really a passion for you. Yeah. What I'm curious about is what are the stories in your past that have made this so important to get this message out and start this conversation? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I think it comes because I, as, as you mentioned, I spent a bazillion million years on Grey's Anatomy. I was there for from 2004 till 2015 um, in one, one show. And during my time there, by the time I left, the 
the editor taking over for me as lead editor had been the post PA our our first season, and it became very quickly recognized that especially I set this. I set an example. I I moved up from being an assistant editor to an editor pretty quickly there. I think a lot of people saw that that opportunity existed there if you really wanted to pursue it. And so we had, I, I'm trying to think, um, Phil Fowler, Vanessa Delgado, Kyle Bond, now Travis Weaver. Oh God. So that's at least, that's at least four. That's at least four post PAs that turned into assistant editors and are, I think all now editing. Maybe Travis is just on the verge of, of making that transition. And that's pretty, that's at least four. And, well, and, then, you, and then Joe Matasic, of course, um, who was the one I, I first mentioned. And then a lot of our, edit- oh, David Greenspan also, um, Justin Chin. So yeah, we so now the numbers just keep exploding. So we really did have this almost, you know, creative factory that was happening where we were, we were bringing people up from, they were coming in as a post PA. We were mentoring them about how to get into the union because they would usually have to go off and work um, maybe on a reality job or a non-union job to get their hours into the union. And then they'd come back and come in and, and be assistant editors for us and pretty, you know, some of the editors were getting to chances to direct. And so when the editor would get bumped up to direct, usually their assistant would get bumped up to cut the episode. And it really was this cycle that was going on. However, what I also saw was happening was that at a certain point of the entire editorial staff, I was really the only one left that had had any substantial experience as an as a union assistant editor prior to Grey's Anatomy. Everybody else had, you know, maybe just dabbled somewhere to get their hours to come in and come back to get into the union. But I was the only one who really <laughs> worked for, I was an assistant editor for four or five years before I came to, to Grey's. And I worked on, you know, an enormous Tom Cruise feature film. And I worked on, you know, a lot of cable movies and documentaries. And I, I'd had some experience with different editors and and I, I guess I saw that what they were really missing was the diversity of experience, number one. <laughs> every project is very different. Every editor is very different. And every workplace is very different. And some are much more um, sort of union aware than others. And Grey's Anatomy and Me had become a very collaborative place, but it was, you know, <laughs> it was sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to get too much into it, but, you know, we weren't breaking for meals a lot. There was, you know, certainly some amounts of people working without reporting their hours exactly right. And I just, and I wound up being kind of almost deemed the, the, the union expert. Like everyone would come to me if they had a question about their time card, about what was, you know, the way to put down if you worked on a holiday. And I, I just really felt like all all these kids here are going to go out in the world and they're talented editors with an incredible work, work ethic, which you just learned on any Shondaland show. But I was like, there are some bad habits that I see being formed as well in terms of self-care and in terms of knowing what your rights are. And I think just, you know, you work in one place for so long, we just become used to doing it a certain way without realizing that that may not be exactly proper here and there. And I was part of that as well. And so it just, it really came, became clear to me once I left there and I started working on other shows and just seeing different cultures um, and realizing that, you know, I want to make sure for the, the good of our, our guild, like on the long term, that we start instilling good habits as early as we can and that we support each other as union brothers and sisters, <laughs> as creative collaborators you know, but also look at it from a realistic perspective too. Like, you know, we can't sometimes, you know, be very serious and firm about every single rule, but, but like you really should deserve to know what your rights are and how you can be protected. And then of course, also like you should know that you as an editor are one of the Titans in the room. And I felt like that was sometimes getting a little lost as well. When you've started in one place as a post PA and you become an editor there, you may not be walking into that room as an editor with the a perspective of if you've been cutting for 10 years somewhere else, um, knowing that you are one of the leaders and one of the, the major artistic collaborators on the table. And I just wanted to make sure that there was a chance for assistant editors to, to really acknowledge to themselves once they were leaving assistant editor behind and becoming an editor that they were um, embracing a perspective shift as well and knowing just not just their rights, but owning their power <laughs> and, and their strength in terms of 
what they have to offer to the people they're working with. Again, this is also all for long-term gains for all of us, <laughs> you know, so that it strengthens our our guild as a whole and our our um, our representation in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I'm curious about with the, the panel specifically, and I think this will help uh, answer a lot of uh, larger questions as well, just beyond the panel. But for the people that attend this panel, what I'm curious about is what is the most common question or questions that you seem to be getting from people that are making this transition? What are they really struggling with the most? That's interesting. We saved the question and answer to the very end. And the the question that came up the most, and I'm going to incorporate it into our next workshop, was dealing with conflicts with your assistant editor. And I found that to be so surprising and yet delightful because it's a very real truth to our industry. It's it's a close collaboration between editor and assistant. And when you have been an assistant for so long, obviously you've probably developed an incredible set of skills. And then you, based off you know the the uh, off the skills you've you've demonstrated, you get to become an editor. And so then you pick your own assistant editor and that's something you've never done before. So that's one of the first decisions you have to make as an editor is picking your, choosing your assistant editor. Sometimes you actually inherit an assistant editor and that's its own kind of bag of problems sometimes. And so it wound up being an issue that was many, many people brought up at the workshop. And I think we'll, we'll talk about much more in depth at the next one and the ones here out. Because again, it's, it's one of the first decisions you make that shows the team who you are as an editor by the person you're choosing to be your closest ally. And then how to... Again, it's a, it's a leadership training thing about how to manage, how to be a manager, how to supervise, how to protect that person that you have now hired and that you are supervising and how to manage any problems or issues that are coming up in a constructive way. So in addition then, it, it, uh, it doesn't surprise me, but it does surprise me that that was the most common question. I've certainly seen this happen before. I had a, an assistant editor for years and years that was working under me, and then she um, grew into her own position and started to transition to editor and is now a full-fledged editor and has done several seasons on her own. But the number one call I always get from her is, oh, I'm dealing with this issue with my assistant and I don't know how to handle it. Or I can't find somebody good or whatever it is. So it's, it's always that question. So that, that's, um, it's really interesting that that's what came up in the panel as well. Um, so in addition to managing an assistant specifically, what are the most common areas or topics that you talk about in this panel? Like what are the, the, the headlines? Let's say that somebody's listening to this right now. They're an assistant just on the verge of making the transition. What don't they know that they don't know? Well, the first thing I, I, we do at the workshop is we talk about that it's, that the, it's a safe space and that there's no, there's no union rep we hosted at the editor's guild, but there's no union rep in the room. You know, no one's gonna no one's gonna get reported or flagged if they're talking about working overtime without reporting it or anything. I mean, obviously, we don't want people to do that, but we really wanted people to know it was totally a safe space to to talk with to, for real talk about the way we work and the problems we face. And so, um, and that was great. That's one reason why it's not recorded at all. Uh, you know, they did an article talking about it after the fact, but we're not recording it because we want people to be able to speak with, you know, anonymity or confidence and to, to hear from, you know, the veterans who are there to advise them. We're speaking from our own war stories as well. And, and um, so anyway, so the, the, the main topics that we get into are um, the first one is about dealing with overtime. And it's just something that assistant editors often are asked to do. Very often, they're often they're put in the, the position where they have to do overtime that they're not really able to get approval for or not allowed to report. And so then sometimes that carries over when they're editors, that they either are doing a lot of unpaid overtime, partly because at the beginning at your, of your career, you feel like maybe I'm slow and I shouldn't be billing for this time. You know, it's it's taking me, it takes me longer to do this than it takes a seasoned editor. So I shouldn't put in for all my hours. So we talk about those issues and how to manage that, what's appropriate to do, what feels right for you. And then also how you can protect your own assistant editor and not perpetuate that problem that maybe you had as an assistant. And then you feel like, are you, do you have the right then to ask your own assistant because to do unpaid overtime because you did tons of unpaid overtime? So it's, it's, we talk very realistically about that issue. And um, I think it's an important one. And again, just protecting our rights, but also getting the job done and, and getting it done, you know, when you're at that early stage in your career and you feel like, you know, maybe you do need to do a few more passes than you might need to do later down the road. 
the next thing we talk about is time management. Sounds a lot like overtime, but it kind of dovetails nicely because time management, and this is an area I think you're going to agree with, uh, as Zach has said, it also involves self-care. <laughs> you know, oh, yes. Yeah. So I, I, I have four soapboxes that are just getting warmed up right now. <laughs> right. I'm talking about time management and self-care. <laughs> yeah. It's Christmas. Exactly. And um, and that was a really that was a really creative part of our, our first workshop. One of our panelists was Lizzie Calhoun, and she talked about organizing and procrastinating, which is basically a little bit of a reward system where you, you know, you get to procrastinate a little bit, but she also like keeps meticulous logs of when she's, how long, when she, she would write down the time she would start a scene and the time she would finish it. And then she would write down, you know, so she would sort of keep herself organized, but also allow herself to, to just put something off. And I talked about how you know, I had had an episode recently with this huge sequence at the end that I, I was like, I should love this sequence. It's so visual. I'm so excited about it. And, uh, and yet there was so much footage that it was just like this mountain I didn't want to climb. And, and I just kept waiting and waiting to cut it. And I finally, you know, uh, and another editor friend of mine says the same thing, that sometimes that hardest scene, if you just wait and wait and wait and wait, but then you cut it, you have to cut it with such speed and precision that actually it winds up coming out great. <laughs> you know, the thing you've been dreading. So we just talked about how sometimes that can be the thing that happens. Just talking about social media and dealing with that at work and how to how to manage that. Um, and then also ways to take breaks and make sure that you get to take those breaks. Lou, Wait, what are breaks? Maybe you need to put a link in Wikipedia a, a to what that means. A break is when you, you stop working for a short... But wait, you short... can't stop working because then the show will never air. So how is that possible? I don't get it. Well, you can have tricks like Lou Vu, who is also on our panel. He brings his dog to work. Well, you know, nobody wants to let the editor get up and go to the bathroom, but they'll let the dog go outside to go to the bathroom. So he gets to take his dog outside for a doggy break. And imagine that he gets a break himself. So there's, 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 there's ways to get it done. And that's, that's another thing we talk about. Um, and then the third major topic we talked about is called, is, was finding your voice. And that also covered learning to work with showrunners, learning to work with producers, learning to work with sometimes big, scary personalities and developing your own voice so that you are an, uh, you know, an equal or a, an important collaborator in the process as well, which sometimes can feel hard to that can be one of the harder shifts from being an assistant and going into being an editor that suddenly you have this voice, a strong voice in the room and how to use it and how to understand what's going on with the the showrunners and what they're bringing into the room as well. We had um, our other, our other panelist was Monty DeGraff and he's a, he's a, a veteran has been around for, for a little, a little while longer than the rest of us on that panel. And he, you know, he's on the original Star Trek next generation and he was amazing talking about this and uh, just telling us about just different uh, tough situations he'd been in and, and, and really understanding how, where the showrunner was coming from when he was screaming and yelling and realizing that this was a person that actually needed his compassion and not his fear. And, um, and that um, once he was able to look the guy in the eye, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing his story imperfectly, but that basically it, it moved their relationship forward. Um, once he was able to to get this person to realize that they were on the same team and that he, on his point of view, could realize how much external pressure this showrunner was runner was under, that he just he needed an ally. And he just needed to make the showrunner see that he was that ally. And so he talked about flexing your courage muscle, which I, we just all thought was like the greatest phrase of the day that that is such an important thing that we have to do in our job. A lot of editors, you know, they say, oh, we work in these dark rooms. Well, there are a lot of editors that are introverted and maybe quieter and more, maybe are more cerebral and <laughs> we're sensitive because we're artists too. And so dealing with big personalities and anger in the creative process can be really difficult. So for me, it was so wonderful to hear Monty talk about that courage muscle because, um, yeah, I need to use it myself <laughs> as much as possible sometimes on this job. So those were kind of the three main elements that we covered over time, time management, and finding your voice. I feel like all of those really, you know, do have a strong contribution to being leaders uh, on the show that you're on. And because um, you're, you're leading, you know, you're supervising assistant editors, you're working with a lot of people, either as they're 
peer or sometimes as their supervisor, you know, you're on a mixed stage, you're at color correction, you're working with visual effects people. You know, people think our job is very solitary, but actually we interact and manage a lot with a lot of people. So we just kind of want editors to start thinking about how they can provide that leadership and streamlining in the best possible way that ends up making their lives happier (laughs) too. Well, it sounds like there are a ton of good strategies uh, within this panel itself. And I would have given anything to have something like this when I was much younger in my career. I actually didn't really make the transition from assistant to editor per se, the way that most people do. I was an assistant for about five months out of college at a very small boutique trailer company. And I realized very quickly that I'm a terrible assistant and I have no interest in being an assistant. I did not see it as a path (laughs) because for me, I just wanted to cut. Um, So I decided that I was going to sell the owner of the company on the fact that I'm worth more to them as an editor and an assistant. I ended up selling them on that exact concept. But it means that from that point, five months out of college, all the way through the rest of my career, all I did was cut. But I spent years cutting in the indie world, meaning that I was by myself. I was my own assistant editor and my own editor. And it was very much about just the craft. I was just an artist. And I just had to you know, work on the show and maybe manage one person. So it was usually a director. And that director also was young and had no idea what they were doing. And I think I've worked with like seven or eight first-time directors. Um, so I've been, been through that process. But it wasn't until I went into the world of TV that I was like, whoa, there is so much more to know about the politics of being an editor than just, I know my way around a timeline and I can fix story problems. So like being in the room, quote unquote, was just a giant smack in the face when I landed in television. I'm like, this is completely different than the world that I'm used to. So I would imagine that that's where a lot of the conversations end up. Yeah. Well, what I realized also was because I'd had the experience of working on some features, especially like a super, you know, top tier Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai. I, I had this front row seat to seeing editors who were just so huge. I mean, they were, they were so important and the respect paid to them was just amazing to see. And it was a huge team. And we were even back still in the days of film, we had a whole room of film conformists so we could have a conformed work print, even though we had tons of visual effects and I'd never worked on such a big team. And, um, there were, uh, you know, it was, it was really an incredible eye-opening experience. And I'm so grateful for it because, as an assistant editor, I was so creatively challenged on that. Um, the expectations of me were a- enormous. I learned a ton. And then I carried that experience forward with me when I became an editor, just remembering the respect with which the editors were treated, which to be truthful, I did not see editors in television being treated the same way. I was going to say, we're, talking, <laughs> we're having two very different conversations. All I know, of a sudden. <laughs> I know. And so I'm so grateful that I have that experience. And it's one reason why on the, on the next upcoming panel, we're going to do, and, and in fact, on all of them, I'm also trying to incorporate fe- um, feature film editors, or, or at least editors who work in both features and television. The initial idea had been, oh, we'll just focus this on TV because assistants move up so much more quickly in, in TV. And we had a surprising number of new editors at the the workshop panel, um, who were coming from the feature world. So I'm, it's very important to me that we incorporate, um, editors with feature experience on, on the, as the leaders of the panel, because I think they can speak from that, um, that position of, of authority, of respect that really needs to kind of become more common again. (laughs) And I, 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 that's another thing I feel like, you know, when I saw so many assistant editors at, uh, in, in Grey's Anatomy, only having experience on that one show and then becoming editors on that show, I was like, God, they really need to be great if they could get out there in the world and, and see um, all shades of experience and representation that are out there. Um, and so then, you know, what you had asked me also, it's the, the origin story for this workshop. At the end of my career at Grey's Anatomy, I, I did get the chance to direct a couple of episodes. You know, I shadowed a lot. I was in the ABC Diversity Mentoring Director Program. I did a lot of my own shadowing to, to prepare for that. And still, you know, it's like, it still is a shock every time you do it. And after I left Grey's, the DGA started a program for new directors, which was this one-day huge workshop where they would have three veteran directors come in and take take any director that was you know that was going to be a first time director on a prime time television or cable streaming show it was became a mandatory orientation that was part of their um, 
their bargaining agreement with, with the producers that they would start doing this, this orientation. Our workshop, of course, is optional and voluntary, but, but I wound up knowing one of the directors, um, Rebecca Asher, who was one of the leaders of this workshop and talking with her about it. And it just, it sounded so great. And I, you know, I called up the, the DGA and I said, you know, it's been a couple of years since I directed and I would love to, to take this as a refresher. And they were like, nope, nope, it's only limited to people who are booked on a on a on an upcoming you know episode. And I thought, well, that's, that's okay, that's that's your prerogative. Um, but uh, it occurred to me this would be an incredibly useful thing to do for editors as well. And around that time, I was also going through the selection process for for ACE, American Cinema Editors, and it just really made me. It gave me a chance to have some reflection on what I'd accomplished and what I still wanted to do and, and, and how I could give back. And so I just, I just started nursing this idea of like, what if we did that kind of orientation workshop for editors, for new editors who are about to, to make the leap or have just made the leap or still are feeling their way in their first couple, their first year on the job as an editor. And um, so that was, the, that was the inspiration for it. And um, I happened to bring the idea up at my my ACE interview, and I, I could see like a lot of members of the committee were, you know, people I really respected and admired, and they were just nodding their heads like this sounds like a great idea, and so that gave me gave fuel to the fire that I, it was something worth pursuing to see if I could try to, try to make this happen. And then um, I happened to go to another networking event. Love networking events. I'm sure you do too, Zach. <laughs> Actually, really... I hate them more do than you? life itself. <laughs> I've just learned how to stomach them. Okay. And now I, now I teach other people how to stomach them. That, that, that should just be the name of my new program. That's so interesting. How to stomach networking events. I usually find them to be... Yes, I usually dread going to them, but I leave them usually feeling very excited and happy and exhilarated. Agreed, 100%. You know, I mean, that's, I, so I think, yes, from that perspective of like, oh, you know, here's another one. But then I leave them and things happen, you know, in my life because of the connections I made there. And so one of them was, a there's an Alliance of Women Editors organization and I, we do some brunches a couple times a year. And I, I met Molly Shock, who's an amazing woman, multi-dominated for everything. And she is also one of the, I think she's a board member of the Editors Guild or uh, I'm pretty sure she is. And she's, she's ACE. Happened to meet her at this brunch and we both live in the Valley and I gave her a ride home. And she was mentioning she was on like the membership committee and I just brought up the idea. I said, you know, I have this idea and I don't even know what to do with it. I don't know what the next steps would be. I just, I just think, I don't know if this is too huge of a project to try to take on as an editor. And I'm also a parent and, you know, have a, have a, have a, you know, I'm a wife. I have <laughs> I got two jobs, you know, already. And, um, and so uh, I just said, I, I'm, I'm afraid to do this all by myself, but I just think it's an idea that would be really great and could be really helpful. And she thought it was fantastic. I mean, I just sort of pitched the idea in general and she thought it was great. And she spent fully like nine months just reaching back to me, just saying, Hey, I don't, cause I was in the middle of, of some crazy jobs right then. And, and I think, you know, my kids were both starting new schools and I was like, too much is happening in my life. So she was just very patient and she would just circle back and be like, Hey, I'd love to revisit that idea. Um, I, you know, she brought it up to the membership committee, um, membership and outreach committee at MPEG and, and they responded really positively. And she's like, if you want to come in and talk about it and, um, and her just sort of gentle support and patient support made all the difference. And just me feeling affirmed and, and that I was going to have the help I was going to need to do it. And so finally, you know, we really set a date. I was like, I have this job. It's finishing on this day. I think, you know, we should meet right after that job ends. And then we'll set a date for the orientation like a few months later. And then that will give me that deadline in between then and the next thing to accomplish it. And of course, in the meantime, I had, you know, some uh, thing happen in my, in just my family life that I was like, this is taking some priority right now. She was like, no problem. We'll push it back another month. So, you know, things happen when they happen. And once we got that first one done, it just was like, it was so exciting and it went so well. And I feel like I have the format now, at least like the loose format to, to keep it going. And so, um, and so many editors responded positively that they would love to be a part of it. So I'm just so excited to have this revolving door of panel of superhero editors talking to people and hopefully giving them constructive 
advice and, and guidance in their careers. Well, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> uh, good for you for, for taking this on and, uh, you know, realizing that there's a certain point where you can spend the rest of your career just cutting more stuff from a dark room, or you can actually give back to the other people that want to get where you want to get as well. So yeah, um, thank I, you. I, I, I appreciate the fact that you looked at it that way. Um, I have one kind of final question or area that I wanted to dive into a little bit deeper. I don't want to go down any crazy rabbit holes. Kind of one of the areas where I get so stuck talking about this transition, and frankly, it drives me crazy, is that the way that our business has changed and the way that it has evolved over the last 10 or 15 years, the job of assistant editor is almost not even a training ground for being the job of an editor anymore. Yeah. Where if you're really a great assistant nowadays, that means that you're an excellent data manager, mm-hmm. and you're very good at turnovers and organizing bins of dailies. But to really be a great editor, there's almost no time to actually do that and get better at the craft and workshop scenes because the job of the assistant editor has just become so overwhelming with information and managing that information and deadlines that keep shrinking. So is this an area that you talk about as well where people can, and, and I know that they've already more kind of made the transition, but I would assume that one of the, the sticking points, and I've seen this multiple times with assistants that have just made the transition, is they realize, wow, so much of my job had nothing to do with what I'm doing now. And I almost feel underprepared because now I am completely 100% creative and cutting these scenes and keeping up the dailies. And it's almost none of my skills transfer. So is this an area that you guys talk about at all? Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's, that's a really important area to cover. Um, and I, I would say that like, I, I've been, been lucky enough to do both one hour drama and half hour comedy. And I feel like I can see pretty clearly that assistants move up much faster in one hour drama than they do in half hour comedy. And the largest reason for that is that half hour comedy is very, a very important part of the creative process is um, scripting dailies where, you know, the assistant editor has to literally take the text of the script and stick all these dots all over it that tie to the daily, the line in the dailies. And that is the way, you know, especially comedy directors and producers love to go through takes really quickly because they'll have so many, you know, they'll have nine takes of a single line and they want to very quickly, like, you know, hear them all. And so that, burden of scripting dailies for comedy assistant editors takes up all of their time and leaves very, very little time for creativity. Whereas I feel like in one hour drama, there's a lot less scripting. The assistant editors get more relied upon for um, creative sound design and scoring. And so it just, you know, to me, from my perspective, I see their opportunities are larger for them to get moved up. And so that's like, that's kind of addresses what you're saying that, that technical data, you know, management, for is is keeping assistant editors and comedy from moving forward um, from my point of view. And I, I see it happening to people in, in scripted drama all the time oh, as okay. well. Oh, okay, okay. Um, my, my assistants love me because I hate script sync. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. I'm like, they're like, oh my God, do I have to script sync for you? I'm like, no, please <laughs> not. Because I, I, don't, I don't like it at all. I don't fault anybody that does use it or rely on it. It's just not for me. Um, but I can't imagine how any of my assistants would have any room to grow into the creative side of the job if I were asking them to script sync because there's just there are barely enough hours in the day as it is. Yeah, no, it's it's true. I mean, and it, I find that it actually slows me down because I'm waiting so much longer for my dailies, <laughs> you know, because they've got to script them all. But um, so that is something that we do talk about because I know for me, it's very much the idea of you've got to pay it forward. And it was the editors that went to bat for me, Brianna London, Victor Dubois, and Ed Ornelas when we were all on Grey's Anatomy together that first season. It was a 3-2. When I, that, it, and I don't, if you know what that means, that means there's three editors on one show and two assistants. Mm-hmm. They don't yeah, do I've that, on, that I've much. been on one of those. Yeah, yeah they don't do it because it's, it's impossible. It's but impossible. I wasn't on a show like that. But the best thing about, the one good thing about it was that as an assistant, I got to assist three different editors in one season. And it was really eye-opening and educational just to see how, how they, not just you know, were what kind of different editors they were in, the, in their workflow, but how they interacted differently with directors and producers. It was that, that for me was the best training ground to become an editor was that year of the three, two, you know, that, that I was able to just like literally just slingshot in between three different editors rooms and, and see their process. And all of them went to bat for me to become an editor on that show. And it, it would have never happened without them vouching for me. So I, I've personally made an effort with my assistants to mentor them as well, to give them scenes to cut, to occasionally, you know, when, I, when we can 
actually do an act. Maybe they get to do a whole act, make that happen. And then, um, you know, on my last show on This Is Us, my, I was able to get my assistant editor a co-editing credit with me on one episode, you know, really advocated for her to take over for me when I, when I left that show. And so she, um, she is really thriving there. And I'm, I'm so thrilled for her. And so I think that's part of what it takes, though, is like you, you have editors have to actively be aware that we need to mentor and we need to train and that it, it can't just all be on the assistant editors to like ask for it, that, you know, editors themselves also have to really be proactive in making it happen in, in, in just getting the next generation ready to, to do what we're doing and ready to be our own peers. <laughs> you know? So I just think that's part of what the workshop is about is, is mentoring and sort of demonstrating how to mentor and how, you know, what? it's, it's never too late to be mentored either. And that's, that's one thing that I got out of the, the panel was like, when I, I'm, I'm a workshop leader of it and, you know, yet hearing what my fellow panelists were saying was totally, you know, eye-opening for me and fantastic to hear about. I, when I, when I left Grey's Anatomy after editing there for 10 years, the first job I had, um, was with, uh, an editor named Stuart Bass. And I think he retired a year or two ago and he's, he's just comedy legend. And he was, he just completely changed my mindset about lunch, <laughs> which sounds like a small thing. But it has oh no, made, that's a big thing. Oh, it's a huge thing because I was coming from a show where oh they had lunch on set and we'd go down and get it and take it back to our avids and we'd sit and eat at our avids and I was always like oh if I don't really take lunch then I get to go home sooner which never really happened and Stu was so just adamant that as a team you know both editors and our assistant editors every day we'd walk over to the commissary together we'd sit down and we'd chat and talk about lives and homes and families and vacations and just everything. And it was just delightful. And I, it was literally like, oh, I've, I feel like I've never done this before. And to make it a real habit was, and, and a real, like, um, it just, it fostered this sense of loyalty. Uh, he and I were very collaborative on the show. We'd help each other out with scenes when we needed. And um, it, it was really, I'm so grateful to a, a veteran editor who, for me, I was already like 10 years into my editing career at that point, really made me pivot in my own work habits and change them for the better. And so that's another thing I want to pay forward as well, you know, make sure my own assistants take lunch and that we stop and we take a break and you know, do all these things. Because it's, it's very hard to create those habits. You know, you have to do them over and over again to make it a habit. You can't just do it once in a while. So, uh, yeah, so it's things like that, that I think, you know, we can still learn as older editors, uh, you know, whatever as well. We're, we're not too young to be learning stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and I think it's, it's such a good point that, um, going back to where we started, where the, the editor really has to learn leadership and management skills that maybe you don't pick up as an assistant. Yeah. And really you have to be the change that you want to see at your office. Right. Yeah. Um, like for, for example, I mean, I'm obviously a huge advocate of taking breaks and not eating at your desk. I've, I've been very, very vocal about that. But when I first started, at all of this, it wasn't very easy to be vocal. Mm -hmm. um, five or six years later, sure, everybody talks about it. But when I was first saying it, I was it was like heresy. Like, how dare he say that, right? <laughs> yeah. When I started the this season of Cobra Kai, um, it was my first day. And there was a, another team that I think it started maybe the day before, even the day of. And they were new to the show. Very seasoned, very experienced editor and experienced assistant. So they had been around the block and had been on very many shows. And uh, when I walked in, we were getting ready to, to go out to lunch. I went by his door and they were both sitting at his little table in his edit bay windowless room, just kind of, you know, hunched over the, the food and shoveling it in. I'm like, uh, no, this, my friends, is not how we do it at Cobra Cut. <laughs> you guys are going to come outside. You're going to see the sunshine. And we're going to get to know each other for the next hour. And they just kind of looked at me like, Really? What? <laughs> and then from that point on, they saw that it was not only acceptable, but encouraged to get away for lunch and people weren't going to kind of, you know, give them a demerit for it. But it, was, it wasn't forced. Like if they wanted to spend the day in their edit bay and they were busy, like there was no shame in that. Yeah. But I wanted to make it very clear when I walked in that door that they knew that it was part of our culture and it was important to actually step away and take time for themselves. And somehow the show still gets on television. Yes. <laughs> it does. No, that's, that's absolutely fantastic. I think it, and, and the thing is the, the sort of 
the model of television has changed so much today. There aren't a lot of shows like Grey's Anatomy where it's you're going to be 10 years in one place. You know, that was that was an anomaly even back then. Now we're all very, very much more nomadic. And so we're taking these habits and these workplace practices with us from job to job and exposing them. We're like a good kind of virus, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> we're exposing them <laughs> so to, 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 to more and more people and, and create, you know, yeah, I want to, I want to infect people with good habits as much as I can, you know, and also I need the, I still need the reminders myself for sure. Uh, <laughs> that, that is definitely true. I mean, just by the way, uh, Zach, I have, I'm not sitting in it right this second, but right next to me is my sit tight Yay! Um, fantastic stool that I switch to. I rotate between standing the air on chair with, a, with my ergonomic back pillow and um, standing with the topo mat or my sit tight. And that all came from you. Um, because you're like a walking advertisement it. right now. I didn't totally. pay her, by the way, for anybody no, listening. And I, honestly, because I've had back issues my whole life. And, you know, and it's not only, but it's also, it's interesting because it's not only physically helpful, but it's a great talking point because people walk in my room and they're just like, what is that? And I can't tell you how many writers and directors have been like, can you give me the name of that thing again? And I might want to use that. You know? And, uh, and it's, it's, I always like to see who, who dares to sit upon it, who has the courage to sit upon it when we have to have a bunch of people crammed into my room. <laughs> you know, because, yes. It's, it is an awesome conversation starter. Yeah. Ooh, what's that? Can I try it? It that's is. Awesome. And actually that's something that I even talk about at the workshop that it's, it's, it's great to have like conversation starters because a lot of a lot of writers are very introverted too and and small talk is tough for them also and so i i sort of fill up my room with little things that make it easy to just have something innocuous to talk about and i think that's also you know it makes everybody's lives easier so yes and that, that's things. something we could certainly go a lot deeper into that and people can learn about it on the panel but what the, i'll just close that thought very quickly by saying that one of the the most important things that you want to focus on, and this is for all editors, not just people that are transitioning, but you may not be as aware of how important it is if you're just transitioning. You have to create a really comfortable, safe working space. Yes. There are so many directors and producers that will just hide in my edit bay and say, this is the one place. Mm-hmm. Well, don't bother me. And I just feel calm. This is my Zen space. Don't tell anybody I'm in here. If you can do that, you're going to be hired until the end of time. Yes. I learned this. I learned that you know, on the pilot of Grey's Anatomy, actually, because my editor threw me through the Sh- Shonda Rhimes and uh, her producing partner in my avid bay with me to work on the music because they were at odds with the director who, and the, and another showrunner who just didn't, didn't love the idea of songs being in the show. And, and he was like, I think that Shonda's right. I think this is a great idea. He's like, uh, go take them in your room and put, put all the best music you can find. And it was, it was Shonda's first pilot. And so I just said, I was like, this is the room where we can try anything. It's funny in the Me Too era, you can't really, I can't really say that anymore. <laughs> that, used <to> be my, <laughs> that used to be my catchphrase. This is the room where we try things. Now I don't feel like I can say that as much, but safe space. It's for sure a safe space to make creative, to make creative choices and it's okay to fail. I actually just saw um, my teenage cousin gave a talk on failure and he, he made fail into an acronym, which was first attempt in learning. And I just thought that was so great because yeah, an editing bay is the room of second chances. You can, tr- you can, you know, something might've failed, but you, we can fix it here. And to be honest with you, that's one reason why I found directing to be not very satisfying because as a director, I felt like I would walk in with a vision and it would get chipped away and compromised and told no and not turn out. And just, I, I, it felt so diminished. I felt so diminished by the end of <laughs> directing, to be honest. But as an editor, I feel victorious and heroic so often. And it, because somehow I can make miracles happen in here. And that's why I totally have cho- I've chosen to kind of double down as, uh, as an editor because it's creatively fulfilling and, you know, this is where we get things done. So. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, clearly yeah. I'm a proponent of getting things done. Yeah. Um, if <laughs> if I could change my birth certificate, I'd probably uh, have, you know, getting things done somewhere in my, uh, my name somewhere. It's, I'm, I'm all about that. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I feel like we've just barely gotten started, and I realized that I've uh, I've poorly managed my time, which yeah. is so ironic and paradoxical. <laughs> We're ten minutes over, just because it's, it's that okay. much of a pleasure chatting with you. No um, but for, for anybody that is interested in learning more, first of all, I implore you. 
um, to get information about one of these upcoming panels. And uh, I don't know the exact dates, but according to when this is going to release, it should be releasing right around the time that you guys are enrolling for your latest panel uh, at the end of March. But in general, if somebody listening today was inspired by everything you have to say and they want to either learn more about you or they want to connect with you directly, how can they do so? They can email me. But I always, almost my first response to people on email is that uh, if you don't hear from me, just keep trying, keep trying because, you know, email just piles and goes away. You know, it, it, it disappears into the inbox. And so um, I really, that's an adv- piece of advice I give to almost anyone that if I'm not able to meet up with them right away, I'm like, just keep emailing me, keep emailing me. And um, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll find time. Um, I try to make good use of my commutes by having these kind of networking phone calls with people who are looking for advice, um, you know, on my morning drive. So um, my email is susanvale at me.com, S-U-S-A-N-V-A-I-L-L at me, me.com. And I'm happy to be contacted, but with the understanding that, you know, our jobs can be kind of, can, we can be in crazy mode at any given moment. So patience and perseverance are the most important thing. Just keep trying me and I'll get back to you. <laughs> I very much appreciate you being willing to share that information. And it just goes to show for everybody out there that's thinking, oh, I don't want to bother people. and I don't, don't want to send them a message. And oh, they never respond. So they don't want to help me. You're the perfect proof for my program. When I tell them, it's not the fact that they don't want to help you. They're probably just busy and you have to find a way to politely follow up. So you're not nagging them, but you're just reminding them that you're there and you would love to have some assistance or seek some advice. And there are plenty, there's so much more people out there like you than the opposite, which is the image we have in our mind of, oh my God, I'm going to send them an email. They're going to be mad at me for getting their inbox and they're never going to respond. Like, you're the rule, not the exception. But yeah, it's really hard to get a hold of you. And just case in point for anybody wondering, it's taken me four years to get you on my podcast. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. Four years. I'm so sorry, you got to be persistent, people. <laughs> yep, you yep. got to be persistent. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and perseverance, Zach. I, I Always. Was, I, I knew that it would rewarding. provide tremendous value and I was willing to wait until the time was right. And yeah. today the time was right. So I'm yes. very excited about well, that. Well, let's, let's, let's give a shout out. Thank you to Norman Holland, who kind of first introduced us at the Edit Fest mm-hmm. panel years ago and, and really was a mentor to so many. So, you know, it's like in honor of someone like Norm, Norm Holland that I'm just continuing to try to do that work with other editors. Today. Yep, he's he's a big inspiration for why I continue to do what I do as well. So yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah. So uh, well, on that note, Good I deal. cannot thank you enough for you being here today and sharing your expertise. Great uh, means a lot. I can't wait for uh, all the people that are going to listen to this and uh, hopefully find your panel. And uh, just want to thank you once again. Your your time was in your expertise were both very valuable to my audience today. Thank, so you. thank you. The one other thing I want to say, Zach, is that the panel is limited to 30 participants, but we're going to do it like every three months. So there's one happening at the end of March. The next one will be in July or August. We'll probably do another one in November. So if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Patience and perseverance and you'll get to be a part of it. Love it. All right. Thank you so much <laughs> Thanks, for being Zach. here today. Okay. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Optimize Yourself podcast. To access the show notes for this and all previous episodes, as well as to subscribe so you don't miss future interviews just like this one, please visit optimizeyourself.me slash podcast. If you are inspired by today's conversation and you are ready to up your networking game, specifically your outreach emails, then I invite you to download a free copy of my insider's guide to writing great outreach emails. In this guide, I will break down the process of writing outreach emails so you understand exactly what will get you a response. I'm gonna teach you why cold outreach is the most important soft skill you must develop if you want to advance your career, especially during global pandemics. I will show you the five most common mistakes that people make when writing their outreach messages. And then I break down step-by-step how to write an amazing outreach message that will get a response so you can seek advice, connect with a potential mentor, and build the right relationships so when the job market does open again, you are at the top of people's lists. To download this brand new guide for free, visit optimizeyourself.me slash email guide. And that's all one word. Thank you for listening. Stay safe, healthy, and sane, and be well.
This episode was made possible for you by, you guessed it, Ergo Driven, the creators of the Topo Mat, my number one recommended product if you are interested in moving more and not having sore feet at your height adjustable or standing workstation. Almost every new person that I meet in this industry starts our conversation with, hey, I got a Topo Mat because of you. It's changed my life. Thank you. Listen, standing desks are only great if you're actually standing well. Otherwise, you are just fighting fatigue and chronic pain. Not like any other anti-fatigue mat, the Topo is scientifically proven to help you move more throughout your day, which helps reduce discomfort and also increases your focus and your productivity. I'm literally standing on one as I read this, and I don't go to a single job without it. And if you're smaller and concerned the Topo mat might be too big, or you simply don't have the floor space, well, there's a Topo Mini for that. To learn more, visit optimizeyourself.me topo. That's T-O-P-O.